Okay, so um, I'll get right into it. Our mission. The mission of our organization is to protect ecosystems and the wildlife as well as the people who depend on them. Um, and we see the social and the natural environments as one, intrinsically linked, and you cannot treat them in isolation from each other. Um, the, the means the, the, by which we uh, attempt to protect both those environments is primarily through the people. Um, so people are poaching, animals are not poaching. Um, the, the, the challenges and all the problems, depending on how you, you prefer to put it, are people problems, people challenges. And understanding people and understanding, and my colleague, Carolyn Just Robinson is listening here, so I'm going to be very careful to say this. Their perceptions is key. And as she says, we cannot change behavior, we can only change perceptions. Um, before I continue that, in the front, that picture there is a rare image of a Mali desert elephant. One of the last 200, 250 Sahelian desert elephants that uh, continue to exist in the Sahara Sahel uh, in Mali and uh, whose existence continues to be very tenuous. So our vision is to harmonize and enhance existing wildlife protection missions, programs and projects. Um, I'm gonna move away from the script. We don't run, manage, command, direct, we support and our primary means of support is knowledge so we don't bring stuff we don't tell people what to do we offer solutions and we work with them to develop those solutions um, the the wildlife in any given area belongs to that country and the people of that country regardless of whether that's right or wrong and the people are citizens of that country. We cannot come into a place, take over, take command, take control, and expect that to last. Regardless of, again, people's political views, it didn't work with colonialism, and it's not going to work with any other system going forward. We have to work with the governments and with the community, and that's what we do. In terms of law enforcement support, we work with governments. We only train and uh, mentor and support um, government parks and wildlife ranges. And we work directly with communities on the ground in the areas surrounding the parks. So I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go fairly um, fast and, and simply to leave as much time for questions because this is a lot of what we do is pretty out there, for one of a, another expression, um, in some pretty extreme environments that don't get onto the news. Uh, Mali, of course, is in the news at the moment, uh, in, including our uh, the Malian army with whom we work, and that's the picture you see on the on the top left. Um, Malian soldiers who are work in a combined anti-poaching, counter-trafficking unit in Mali. Um, with the rangers, um, supporting them in the conflict area to protect the elephants I mentioned earlier. So the way we go about our work is we focus on three domains. Um, the first is anti-poaching, counter-trafficking operations uh, and support. Socio second is socio-cultural research and engagement. And the third is investigations analytic and analytic support and liaison. The third is very much um, support to organizations from a distance. And we have various partners, uh, including an organization, Sense Clues, and a number of, number of organizations focused on, on security and threat assessments that we work with uh, to advise us and to advise our partners, our government partners on the ground. Of course, the anti-poaching, counter-trafficking operations support 
is working with the rangers, police, and other services uh, in country um, to develop their capacity to protect protected areas, wildlife, and the communities. The socio-cultural research and engagement is very much about supporting the communities in protecting their environment themselves. It is not the old bag of beads here, do what you're told, stay out of the areas, we pay you some money, and off you go. It is the communities themselves doing whatever they can to protect their environments. So we'll get on to that in a minute. So our philosophy, again, is support conservation institutions and structures to capacity building, building their ability to protect these areas. Otherwise, it'll never last. Um, and it, sh it shouldn't say avoiding. Well, it is. We, we do not want to be indispensable. Our job is to make ourselves obsolete. Once we have created or assisted in creating mechanisms, developed doctrine, and I mean doctrine in the, in the law enforcement sense of the term or the broad sense of the term, not religious dogma or anything like that, but the, the set of systems, procedures, um, methods for dealing with a problem. Once that has been transferred, and once there is a, a, a cadre of individuals locally able to continue to transfer that knowledge and to continue to evolve it, our job is done. So we actively try to work ourselves out of a job. Okay, so I'm gonna just talk about the, the training quickly. The three main phases of what we do is we develop doctrine. So we look at what doctrine is currently in place in a given parks and wildlife department, if we're working at a national level, in a particular um, park, national park or other protected area, um, or in a, in a service, in some cases we are uh, working with a particular branch of, of uh, law enforcement. We do not try to impose a foreign or um, doctrine adopted from another area, another service. There's a lot of that happening in Africa, especially with military doctrine, where someone says, this is what I used in Bolivia in the war, and now I'm going to, I'm going to use it here. It worked there, it's going to work here. We do not do that at all. We, everything we do is highly adapted and it is a collaborative process. So what we will do is we will start with identifying what skills, competencies, um, tac tac tactics, techniques, procedures are available. And then we will adapt those and enhance them by bringing in experts um, from different backgrounds of experience and, and, and training um, to enhance that. So, for example, um, Dr. Dean Serrano, who works with us on geospatial analytics, uh, Dr. Carolyn Joss Robinson on sociocultural engagement and, and research, or we have former special operations soldiers, um, police investigators, um, bush babies, game rangers, professional guides who are particularly knowledgeable about a particular environment. And we bring them together with the Parks and Wildlife Department or police or other services. And we work to develop a set of solutions um, to tackle the problem. And we do that in, in, in written, we put that into written form. And we then go out, train the rangers with local trainers. We train the, range, train the rangers, police and other other personnel who, who are mandated to do this work. And we um, then go along and we don't say, there's your training and we wave goodbye. We go into the field with them and we mentor them. And this, the mentors are chosen according to um, the particular environment and the particular need uh, identified. So for example, in working with the Malian army, in the conflict area, um, we're not going to send in a gap year student um, or someone of that nature. Obviously, it's got to be someone highly skilled, um, very experienced, um, who is going to build a close bond with um, those personnel and is going to um, really be able to help them and work with them to develop solutions. So then we go and mentor 
we put it to the test in operations, and then we start the whole process all over again. We go back to the beginning, and we say, right, what has worked, what hasn't worked? And this is a process between a discussion between all parties involved to work out, right, what needs to change, what, how should we improve this? Okay, just a brief, quick overview of, of the projects, the countries we're in, uh, Mali, Burkina Faso, um, obviously both Sahel, Central African Republic, Sahel all the way down into Congo Basin, Democratic Republic of Congo, uh, People's Republic of Congo, and Cameroon. Again, I'm going to talk about uh, primarily Mali and Central African Republic. Uh, but to give you an idea, these areas we're working in, if you, if you add up the, uh, um, the total area of operations, um, just one of those is over 100,000 square kilometers. Um, I can give the, 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 the actual for Mali. I don't want to discuss details of other areas. But in Mali, um, it's 42,000 square kilometers. And in these areas, we are training this year alone over 900 rangers. I say rangers, there's also police and military, uh, depending on the situation. When I say military, they are soldiers who have been given a particular law enforcement, judicial outcomes job to do. And um, they are trained to do that work. They're barracked separately. They uh, are not there to fight a war. Um, the military is often very um, important, especially because of its, um, uh, its uh, uh, specialities such as signals, um, logistics, um, planning, um, and, and so on and so forth. Um, but we work with multiple organizations to apply the best practices from each to tackle the problem of poaching, which is law enforcement. It is not a capital crime unless they're killing the rangers. And we take that very, very, very seriously. So another organization we work with in these places, organizations are human rights group organizations. The first training we have always given has been human rights, prohibition of force, legitimate use of force, legitimate use of lethal force, and so on and so forth. Um, there's recently been a lot of um, uh, debate and a lot of uh, accusations thrown at different organizations all over the world um, relating to shoot and sight policies, to um, accusations of abuse, torture, murder, rape, and so on. Um, human rights training is one of the keys to preventing that, along with professor professionalization of all levels of a parks and wildlife uh, anti-poaching um, cadre. So it, these problems are complex and you cannot avoid any of them. You, you, there are no shortcuts. They have to be intelligently resolved and it's hard work. So training 900 rangers in diverse environments uh, in West, Central, uh, up into North Africa, in conflict zones mostly. As you can see, most of those places are officially conflict, conflict zones, although a lot of them are exaggerated in my opinion, um, is uh, an extremely challenging task. And it cannot succeed with egos, bulldust, hubris, um, or other uh, problematic um, um, ways of mentalities. It has, it requires honesty, dedication, uh, good application of knowledge and skills, experience, sharing, um, debating, and real objectivity and pragmatism, because these areas are lacking in resources and they are vast and the problem is continuously growing, as we all know. Okay, so socio and cultural research, uh, engagement and research. <clears throat> as I said, Dr. Carolyn Joss Robinson is responsible for that. This is the first stop. I'm going to get on to Mali later. When you see the pictures of Mali, what we're doing, and I'm sure many of you may have followed the work we're doing in Mali, 
people say, wow, militarized. You know, we've got armored vehicles, we've got uh, anti-aircraft guns, rocket propelled grenades, and the military, you name it. But this is the reason we succeed, it's community. The military aspect is only there as for security for the Rangers to do their work. Their work is only to fill the gaps that cannot be filled by community. This is absolutely key. In the Gorma, an area the size of Switzerland, 250 elephants that migrate, move continuously throughout the year. Multiple ethnic groups, transhumans, nomadic, as well as centered sedentary, ethnic conflict, religious conflict, political conflict in an extreme environment, natural environment, one of the hottest places on earth, incredibly difficult terrain. We would not succeed if we went out there with the attitude that we're gonna go and find these guys, take them all out or some nonsense like that. There was no poaching in Mali until 2012. When I say no poaching, it was very little. The main reason the elephants were dying out was due to habitat destruction and habitat loss, competition for resources with the communities. But the reason they were there was because the communities themselves had protected them. To a, uh, a pearl, a Fulani person, elephants uh, <clears throat> ensure their livestock are healthier, produce more milk. They, that's because they, they, they knock trees down, their pods down from the trees. Uh, to the, the, the Dogon, they are sacred. Elephants have human flesh in their, in, in their belief system. And to the, 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 the Tuareg, the warriors on, with the swords and the camels that everyone's you know, probably heard of, um, they're a sign of prosperity. They, when the elephants come through, they drop tools and they go and, and uh, have a party. So the elephants in Mali, as in many places, these people live closer to the environments. The communities really do understand the importance of their environment. So all we do is come in and fill those gaps. The gap was already filled in terms of community support by Wild Foundation, who are our partners in there. For many years, they worked with the communities to protect the habitat, the communities to benefit from uh, the forests without destroying them and thus enhancing the relationship with the elephants. In 2012, 2013, the coup, as with another one's just happened, uh, another, a Tuareg rebellion, um, full-scale war, and then a jihadist takeover in, in the north and the center of the country where, we, where our work takes place, and it all fell apart. And that created the opportunity for criminal elements and networks from outside as well to move in and uh, take advantage of the situation. It's important to remember that being a poacher is not a crime. Or being a trafficker is not a crime. It's actually trafficking or poaching. That's the way the law works. So what I'm saying is you always have bad guys, idiots, whatever you want to call them, amongst a population or any population where I'm sitting right now, where you're sitting right now, there are problem people amongst you. It's the situation that allows them to, to commit the crimes, but there are generators that make them do that. And those generators can be desperation, hunger, starvation. Um, it can be religious reasons. They, they need money to go to war. Um, and it can be outright greed and criminality. Um, but you have to choose the right solution for the problem. So community, communities do not behave like that. Getting the communities on side is the first step. So in Mali, the reason that the, the, there was no poaching was because of the communities. Our work was to go in and protect the communities, help them, bring them support and medical and other support, and to uh, facilitate uh, the protection of the, the elephants or the, by disrupting illegal activity. I'm going to move on here. I can talk the hind leg of a donkey. So, of course, anti-poaching operational support. Uh, there's an image of a canine there. We don't, we, we have brought canine detection dogs into areas simply because there's no partner available to do it in those extreme environments. But again, our work is to bring the knowledge. So train the handlers, um, even train the dogs if necessary. But we don't normally bring um, 
any uh, animals or equipment or weapons or anything else that is provided by either the state usually um, or partners. There's the size, there's Mali, the area the size of uh, roughly the size of so South Africa, so about twice the size of France. It's vast, but it only has uh, less than 20 million people, and most of them crammed into the south in the, in the wetter um, southerly region. A few pictures, so uh, up on the right, that's the anti-poaching brigade um, during an operation in, uh, in the Gorma. Um, it's a combination of park rangers, soldiers, and uh, police uh, and other organizations. Um, of the, amongst this group, three are no longer with us. Um, this man on the motorcycle was a community scout. Uh, he was assassinated uh, when he visited his home. Um, and two others were killed. Three have been, three rangers have been killed this year. So in the last few years, we've lost five, five men killed, uh, five injured. Um, and uh, yeah, that is one of the costs of trying to protect the animals in this environment. There are, um, um, that is a, 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 trag a, a tragic situation for us. We do not want to lose one man. And we actively, our work in Mali is actively to avoid conflict, to avoid confrontation. If we were to go out there and start confronting and trying to fight anyone, we would lose and we will exacerbate the situation. So the role of the unit is to understand everything that is happening and support the population and disrupt opportunity for poaching or trafficking. And that is, is, is done through uh, um, predictive analytics. So understanding all the variables, all the factors that create a window of opportunity for poachers and I'm not going to go into the details for security reasons, but it has worked very well. Um, I'll give, get the statistics in a minute. That's one of our, that picture on the, on the left, top left there, is one of our anti-poaching rangers, uh, Tuareg, a Tamashek, uh, um, who are quite incredible people. I'm sure you've all heard of them. This idiot on the bottom left, promptly fell off the camel shortly after this picture was taken. But uh, let's not go there. Okay, so <clears throat> to give you an idea of, of the situation and the results in Mali, um, I'm just gonna focus on this. We don't have a lot of time. Um, in 2015 uh, and 2016, 25%, 20% 20 of the desert elephants were poached. So it was estimated um, two years were left. Rangers were being murdered by violent extremists all over the place. My very first day in the Gorma, a ranger was burnt alive in the neighboring village. Um, and that, that was not necessarily because he was a park ranger, it was because he, he represented government. But that threat to the rangers um, was and is continues to be extreme. And uh, yeah, uh, we're not there to wage war. Um, we're there to protect the wildlife and support those communities. So the results, okay, so we engage, we embarked on a, on a training program initially of the rangers, it was determined we, we, they just did not have enough of the skills and support needed to tackle the problem in this area, in this environment. So we, uh, we brought in, we, uh, a partnership agreement was signed, a tripartite agreement between the military, um, the Ministry of Environment and the Mali Elephant Project with whom we were partnered. And uh, we started developing and training a brand new um, combined army ranger anti-poaching unit, the one you've just seen. Um, it, it started operations at the end of 2016. In 2017, it was fully operational. We did not lose, we have not lost a single elephant in 2017. In 2018, the unit had to stand down temporarily. Five elephants were killed. In 2019, not a single elephant was, was killed. Just recently, at the start of the COVID, there was one elephant killed, um, probably a test to see how, with all the lockdown, what was going to happen. I won't, go in, I won't discuss any further what, what the, our response was to that. Um, but 
this means, this, the story of this effort in Mali is about collaboration and cooperation. Um, a community project partnering with a law enforcement support um, organization, the military, the police, and the United Nations. Equipment was provided and funding was provided by the United Nations for the Rangers and the Canadian Fund for Inter uh, International Conservation um, for the whole unit. And also with support from um, Elephant Crisis Fund and, and others. But this concerted combined effort um, against all the odds has succeeded Touchwood to date. So it's five years, we're now five years later, the elephant population in Mali, in spite of all the fighting, is growing. Um, but there's been a cost, and there continues to be a cost, both in human lives and in monetary terms. I'm gonna move on to the next uh, area, just a few pictures there, just to give you an idea of the environment. The, this picture on the top left here is um, typical of uh, central um, Sahelian Mali. Um, this is Homburi, um, absolute, um, really, really um, hot spot at the moment. Um, and uh, we've we used it as a base of operations for a long time because it was um, easy for us to access, you know, the area of operation stretches from Timbuktu uh, along the Niger River down to Gao, down to the Burkina Faso border, and all, all the way west to Mopti, which is a vast um, area and but stunningly beautiful one of the most beautiful places I've been in the world um, and uh, sadly it's uh, destroyed. One of our instructors that chap actually doing instruction there he's doing CIED counter IED improvised explosive devices training on the very first patrol the, the unit went out in there were four attempts uh, to to attack it or blow it up and the the, the unit uh, managed to avoid each of those uh, on that occasion, those occasions. Um, but that chap is uh, Matt Croucher, a former Royal Marine, um, very highly decorated soldier. He was awarded the, the George Cross for, for uh, throwing himself onto an IED in, in Afghanistan to save his comrades. And uh, yeah, sometimes we bring in a specialist like that for specialist training. Um, down here on the, on the left, bottom left, this is this is this will give you an idea of the cultural environment in Mali. The man on the right is a Tuareg noble. You can see his blue uh, tamulgust, um, the turban he's wearing. The man on the left is a slave, um, the lowest caste, and he is owned by another person. Um, uh, there are over 250,000 slaves in Mali. It's estimated, uh, possibly more, and the number has grown uh, since the conflict began. Um, just a few other pictures here. Um, this is um, two of our instructors, uh, pilot on the right, um, Russell Gammon, I'm sure will recognize that face. Um, and one of our tactical instructors in the middle and the Malian Air Force uh, officer on the left with a uh, little aircraft um, used for surveillance um, by, yeah, for these operations. Um, on the right, uh, top right, that was one incident where unfortunately uh, the extremists did manage to um, successfully hit the, the, the unit and uh, fortunately none, no men were lost um, and we were able to, they were able to fight them all. On the bottom right, you can see some of the, um, the anti-poaching unit uh, practicing with their weapons and uh, you know vehicles in the background and so on. So it's a really, really, really different world. Um, very, very different to what we're about to talk about, but in some ways, uh, very similar. So Zanga Sanga, I think a lot of people know of Zanga Sanga, the Central African Republic, Congo Basin, rainforest, uh, definitely know Tuareg, uh, there's Bayaka, known as pygmies, which is uh, uh, not the right expression. Um, and a very wet, uh, closed environment. Um, you would imagine completely different, but there are certain important similarities. One is the term convergence. Convergence is a term used uh, currently 
um, in many parts of the world to describe the phenomena of an overlap between different types of um, criminality. So in Mali, in that area we, talked, we just talked about, there is a, an incredible overlap between weapons trafficking, um, human trafficking, and then ivory trafficking through Mali from other areas, both North, South and West East, from West Africa going all the way across to East Africa. And from um, further South in Africa, Burkina Faso especially, right up north towards Algeria, Morocco, and all that way. Um, but there is some drugs locally uh, in Mali, but it's especially weapons and gold. The big one is gold in the Sahel. Um, illegal gold mining and the laundering of it to purchase weapons, fund all sorts of activities, and it is a huge problem. Uh, as an anti-poaching unit, um, it's beyond the scope of a unit to deal with that, but unfortunately it's the same networks involved in all of that. Also, a lot of them are engaged in support for violent extremist groups, logisticians, providing them with weapons, explosives, and, and so on, communications equipment, etc. So tackling the problem often means tackling those networks in a concerted effort. Um, so we do, of course, work with, and as our, our government partners work with, other missions focused on other types of crime, such as human trafficking. Um, often it's, you know, career criminals don't, on, don't make a vanilla career choice. They're opportunists. They will one day do this, you know, gold, and if they see oh, they can make some money out of ivory, they'll do that as well. The most common denominator in a study done by the United States government recently was ivory, an 80% convergence in the area they studied. This was announced, I think, two years ago or a year ago at the, uh, uh, the last uh, uh, illegal wildlife trade, trade conference in London. Um, that, that is the big problem. It requires, you want to disrupt or destroy a network, you need a network to do so. So the similarity in, in Zanga Sanga is you also have ivory moving and drugs, tramadol specifically, uh, being traded and, and uh, for contraband, um, but also sold um, openly. Um, and of course, diamonds, minerals again. Um, Zanga Sanga is in Central African Republic, but right on the border with uh, Republic of Congo and Cameroon and there's a roaring trade. Where you have something like diamonds in Zanga Sanga, or where you have gold somewhere like um, the Goma in the Sahel, you are immediately dealing with a much larger force than you would be dealing with if it was purely just ivory poaching uh, in, a, in a local environment. Um, so uh, Zanga Sanga um, is also difficult. This is, um, just to give you, I'm going to skip ahead here. We don't have a lot of time again, another five minutes. Uh, this is the, the results of the work in Zanga Sanga. Again, it was a completely different environment. It required a very different doctrine, different training, um, but highly adapted to the needs, the situation there. And we brought in everyone from uh, tacticians to investigators to community experts, sociologists, anthropologists, geospatial analysts um, to develop uh, a system for understanding the difficulties there and dealing with them. The big difference between Zanga Sanga and the Goma in Mali is that the, the, the work to deal with the poaching in the Goma started with community and then the law enforcement filled those gaps. In Zanga Sanga, it's been the other way around. It's all been about fortress conservation, protect the area, and as the situation has gotten worse, there's been more and more of an effort to, to fight the poaching, but without truly engaging the community. So we are working with our partners at the moment, especially under the leadership of uh, Dr. Carolyn, to um, move that forward. And that really is the key for any area. Um, it is law enforcement, and community. The two are, uh, cannot be, you cannot succeed with one, only one or the other. 
Um, so um, there has been huge success in Zanga Sangha. So there's poaching events. I'm talking about elephant poaching events in 2018, 29 uh, recorded. There could be more. Obviously, it's very dense. In Mali, uh, you've got open uh, Sahel Desert and the nomads. We've got 850 community members who support us with information on the elephant's movements or any a, a carcass cannot go undetected in that environment, whereas in, in Zanga Sangha it can. However, the, the, the trend is there. So from 29 uh, elephant carcasses in 2018 to five in 2019. Um, again, here's a few pictures of um, what it's like out there. Um, you know, we've made a, a, a major effort with our partners, which is uh, Zanga Sangha Protected Areas, which is a joint venture between WWF and the government, <clears throat> to recruit a local uh, rangers from amongst the Bayaka people uh, and the Bilu, the, the, uh, the, the other ethnic group in the area with whom they have a very symbiotic relationship. And that has reaped huge benefits. Also really teaching and, and working with the rangers on how to engage with the population has dramatically improved their relationship with each other. So basically, Zanga Sangha is less poaching and a much better relationship between rangers and community. But there's still a huge, huge job to be done, a lot of work to be done. Um, up on the right, whoops, uh, ah, gone. Um, so <clears throat> here, a few more pictures. I, I won't go, I'm sure everyone knows the forest elephants on the right. But I just want to say, a forest elephant and a Malian desert elephant, a Sahelian desert elephant, are two completely different species of animal. But a Malian desert elephant is truly a desert adapted bush elephant. It is this. It is a. Uh, an, it is a, an African savanna bush elephant that is adapted to that environment. It is a relic population. They are absolutely incredible. Um, I've never, the first time I saw the tracks, I was absolutely bowled over. I thought this is the biggest bull elephant I've ever seen in my life. And then I discovered it was not a bull, it was a female, it was a cow. They are absolutely gigantic. They have very short tusks. They group in large groups together, close. They are absolutely silent when they move. Um, and they're very dangerous. Um, they kill a lot of people every year and human in spite of that, um, there's very little uh, retaliation by the communities. Um, but uh, yeah, they are uh, not even a subspecies, they're an, an adapted uh, bush elephant. Forest elephant, of course, is a completely different species to a bush elephant, an African bush elephant. Yeah, they are, they move in smaller groups, um, they are much smaller, um, mainly small family groups of you know, five, six, seven, eight. And um, their ivory is the, most, the highest quality. It's, it's uh, pink colored, very dense, whereas bush elephants are less high quality for, 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 for the, the traffickers and the, the people who buy it. Um, but also desert elephants in particular have very brittle short tusks. Their ivory is almost useless. Um, but the value of ivory is so high that they will kill them just for that little bit of ivory. Okay, I'm overstepping the time here. So uh, I'm going to leave it at that. Um, uh, yeah. Rory, thanks. Uh, you're yeah, amazing. Uh, great and nice to know there's dedicated people like you, especially working in areas like uh, Mali. Um, two, two questions and very diverse questions. One, just as a matter of interest, is what, what is the kind of uh, funding you know, that, that this operation in Mali, I mean, I understand that you're working with, um, you know, existing um, government organizations, but what is, what is the meaningful amount of money that you would need as an organization to actually make a difference? Uh, you know, what, you know, you know, if I look at like African parks, for example, you know, you, there's, there's, you know, that, that, you know, numbers around, you know, what they need for basic operations. Do you have a, a, a number, you know, even if it's just a, a thumb suck? And the second thing is, is software. Uh, analytics, uh, intelligence anal analysis, you know, software like, um, you know, there's, there's, there's a lot of talk about it, but I'd be interested to know what software you are using. I've heard of software like Link, for example, where, you know, it's obviously all about what you put in, but I hear a lot of the, the good stuff is military grade. Yeah. Um, okay, the first question, 
um, it's it's important for me to point out that you know you, you've given African Parks as an example. They're funding the entire operation. We have a, a very different approach and philosophy. So what we're saying is that's the state's role. You know, that's that uh, equipment, weapons, what have you. We don't come in and say you need a helicopter or a or a satellite or a, a whatever. We say what have you got? Well, that's what we've got to work with. Uh, we call it a pointy stick uh, 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 philosophy. So all you've got is a pointy stick. Well, that's what we've got to figure out the best way to succeed with a pointy stick. Um, so when you look at an operation like Mali, um, all those vehicles, weapons, and what have you are mostly provided by the Malian government. And, and that is, you know, it's, it's, there's often, often this misconception that African governments are not interested in protecting their wildlife or they're doing it um, under duress, you know, they're really being forced into it. It's not at all true. They do have a political um, difficulty at times persuading um, their voters that they should be spending such money. But on the whole, I do not find when I walk into a classroom in Cameroon or a, um, a, a government office, a, you know, a law enforcement office in, in uh, Burkina Faso, anyone saying that they should not be protecting their parks and wildlife areas. They definitely want to. Um, there are some instances in one particular country where I found I had a huge problem with um, government complicity in poaching um, and trafficking. But on the whole, it, it, it's, it's not the case at all. So what we do is we say we will provide the trainers, mentors, um, and the knowledge, the support in terms of analysts, software, and so on, until such time as they, you know, you, you, they can do it themselves. They don't need our support. That said, in some situation, the mission absolutely requires um, hardware and, and, and other support. So in Mali, for example, that aircraft you saw was provided by the Canadians. Um, sorry, I beg your pardon. That was provided by MINUSMA, the peacekeeping force. And that was a, that's the first time um, that... A UN peacekeeping force has partnered or supported um, an anti-poaching operation, and it was successfully. It, even the UN put a, a clip on on uh, United Nations television in in New York, saying peacekeeping works, and gave <laughs> gave our work as an example. Um, but that support was was crucial. But our cost for keeping guys in the field, salaries, insurance. Um, you know, all their transport, we cannot leave them in these environments. They will get targeted, um, not necessarily by poachers, but it can be all sorts of other individuals who are being impacted by the work. So they have to go back out. We do not allow, we try not to bring in, you use people from local environment. It's, it's just too dangerous. Um, and uh, so it works out at keeping a team in the field works out, it varies anywhere from about 250,000 to 500,000 a year, depending on the number of individuals, um, their backgrounds. <clears throat> to give you an idea, a CIED expert, um, fully certified, you know, who would work for the UN or whatever, who, who we would bring in, say we were to, to bring in a freelancer, will charge no less than $2,000 a day. That's 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 in these environments. So if if they if you're going <clears throat> if you're going to be dealing with IEDs and mines and you have to train a unit, we have to pay those fees. But our mentors, our team, are very dedicated people, and none of us earn telephone numbers. Um, I think every single individual could be earning a lot more doing other work, and that's one of the ways we bring it down. We're also not a company; we're an NGO, so uh, there's no profit component. So we. We keep it down that way. So our aim is to be as cost effective as possible because otherwise it's just not scalable. Um, the second question in terms of software, um, uh, we currently, we, we work with Esri. Esri provide us a lot of support. Okay. Um, so all of their suite of systems, so ArcGIS and what have you. I think it's important to note the SMART is a useful tool that's used in a lot of parks. However, I think a lot of, um, organizations don't realize that SMART is a database and all it does is punch out a report on what you've got in your database. So you still need a ranger trained to collect at one end. Yep. 
and an analyst at the other end. And then there needs to be the conversation between the analyst, the commander, and the frontline ranger on what he needs, what he can get, what the other one needs, what they can get, and what your goal is. And that all starts with your strategy, <clears throat> your your operations plan, absolutely everything has to be integrated into a system. And that's where um, bringing in um, experts from various disciplines, but also different levels. So uh, uh, a senior military officer who is an expert in um, planning, command, control, communications is just as important as the geospatial or other analysts that you have to the team. So what we're doing a lot of the time in terms of the support and liaison is saying, well, this park is not gonna be able to employ all of this expertise. There's no way is one park could afford it. But we can train individuals in these parks and support them. So one geospatial analyst can be shared amongst a number of parks. Sorry, I'm rambling a bit there. Thank you. Let's see if there's any other questions. So, um, uh, Scott, I'm sure your question has been answered. Thanks for that. Thanks, Rory. Any other no hands? Questions. You can raise your hand or go into uh, participants and raise the blue hand. Uh, I see, Bill uh, Guzman. Bill Guzman. Thanks, Rory. Um, Rod? Sevilla? Uh, thank you very much. That was absolutely fascinating talk. Um, uh, I have a question that's a little bit besides, you know, the topic of your talk, but you mentioned at some stage that in Mali, there are 250,000 slaves that are owned by people. And I'm, I'm absolutely flabbergasted. I didn't know that. But who owns these people and who are, are, are the people who are the slaves? Okay, that's the one question. Mm -hmm. um, the other one is, uh, what is the level of corruption in a country like Mali compared to, let's say, South Africa, where we know that in, 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 in parks, you know, rangers have been involved uh, in, in poaching and this and that and the other. And corruption is a huge uh, issue here. Is it any different in a country like Mali? Um. Mali is extremely corrupt. I'll start with that one. Um, you know, I, I, I always hesitate to talk about our partners, um, but no Malian would bat an eyelid at me saying that. It is well entrenched. It is, um, it is really, um, it hinders so much development and um, it's, it's, a tr it's a tragic situation. The coup that's just happened, of course, one of the first things mentioned by the coup leaders is corruption. Um, so yes, Mali is, is incredibly corrupt and navigating corruption is always a difficult thing for us anywhere we go. Um, we do not compromise on it, um, but it's, it's, it's tough. Building relationships is one way to get around um, the, the, the corruption element. Um, by that, I mean, one-to-one -one, um, and uh, individual um, working uh, uh, professional relationships and between organizations uh, that are built on mutual respect, trust, and real true commitment to uh, uh, the cause mission is, is one way of dealing with it. But it always is there and it's, it's, it's a real huge headache for us. Um, but it's one of the things we're dealing with. Corruption is one of those convergence activities, um, elements, I should say. Um, with regards to slaves, it's, it's hard, really, when you, when you first encounter it, to get your head around and, and not uh, become outraged, enraged, devastated by what you see. Um, Mali was formerly the um, French Sudan. Uh, and it was a military colony. It was not uh, a civilian administration, and it was very much at that time, um, more, it was about um, um, strategic interests as opposed to commercial, um, specifically regarding Mali. 
But what the, the, the French administration at that time did was in, put in place laws that outlawed slavery and other practices, but never enforced them. Subsequently, the Malian government, after independence, um, tried to free slaves, um, but stopped trying to free them because the problem is this. If they are fed and they are a part of a community, even though they are the lowest cost, um, they are a part of a structure and a, and a society. Taking them and putting away from that and releasing them with nothing uh, pretty much condemns, condemns them to death and an even worse situation. So the problem has been that there's been no real um, concerted effort or program to really find a solution for the slaves. And it's very much ignored. Um, you know, there are people who say, oh, they're not really slaves. That's nonsense. They call themselves slaves and their owners call themselves slaves. They say, I own this one, this one, and his wife and his kids. And uh, it's, it's really bizarre because it's not like you see in the movies, the relationship. It's not these, the, the, the slaves are, are beaten down and defiant. Um, it's more like uh, Stockholm syndrome. They, they, they look with adoration often at their, their owner and he calls them his children. It's a truly bizarre situation, but I, I, I won't, can't go into detail here, but it's not only Mali, it's uh, Mauritania, um, Niger and other areas. But with the, 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 um, the breakdown of peace and security, rule of law, it's, the situation has worsened. One of the problems in the past is freed slaves and escaped slaves have formed communities. And those particular communities are often now have become violent, violent ex extremist strongholds because you get a group of poverty stricken people um, in the, the worst environment because that's the only place they can find to uh, space um, are uh, you know, been abandoned and there is, is no, there are no society structures or system in place. There's no religious leader, traditional leader, courts um, and all the different roles that people play. And, and uh, there's a vacuum, and that's often filled, filled by, right now, Al-Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb and Islamic State. Yeah. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you. Okay, the next uh, person up is Bindi, Bindi Beck, Maya, if you can. Hello, can you hear me okay? Perfectly, yeah, go ahead, Bindi. Uh, I have a question regarding your time during uh, the COVID lockdown. And I was wondering if poaching's decreased or, or just what it's like there out there in the field compared to here at home. Well, in all honesty, I can't tell you that from personal experience because I've been locked out, <laughs> locked out of the field. Um, we had a, um, uh, a problem in that we had uh, teams locked in. So out in the field, they couldn't, they couldn't get out. Um, a couple of guys, stayed on patrol for five months um, in a really harsh environment um, where normally you would rotate out uh, maximum a month um, and they carried on going for five months. They came out with long beards and you know, turned virtually green, um, but they're incredible guys, absolutely amazing, um, dedicated individuals. Um, yeah, unfortunately, I was locked out and other teams were locked up. We were just about, I was about to fly to Burkina Faso uh, the, day, the, uh, the day after they locked down. And uh, um, we also had problems with Mali and uh, CAR and, and elsewhere. We also had our dogs, uh, two of our, uh, our canine detection dogs in, in Zanga Sanga. One of them fell ill uh, with an infection, eye infection, and then it's his paws. And although there were vets on site, they couldn't do the tests and they couldn't get samples out to, to treat the dogs. So for four months, eventually, we now have the dogs. We brought them to the Netherlands and one has, uh, you know, he's lost his eye, uh, one eye, his sight in one eye, his paws are, are still very bad, but he, he's, he's expected to recover. It was just uh, uh, bacteria that are, are, are not found here, certainly, um, but they would not have been able to, to treat 
uh, because they would not have been able to identify the antibiotics. So it's been very problematic for us, but we've tried to do the best we can from a distance. And of course, monitoring what's going on out there via contact with our colleagues and partners has been very important. The, the, the overall trend has been an increase in poaching everywhere that we know of. Um, and I think there's several reasons. One is there's been a drawdown on anti-poaching and other law enforcement in all of these areas, as well as peace, peacekeeping forces in many places. Um, by a drawdown, I, I, I mean people forced to stay in their bases, in their camps, out of the field um, for a variety of reasons. In some cases, because they, they, they themselves have been put under lockdown. Um, in one case, we had a we had to uh, we had a problem with um, although we could continue work, um, the rangers weren't allowed to gather together. Uh, we can't send one man out on his own in, in those environments, so they were unable to to work other than do some reconnaissance and surveillance work. So um, we've seen seen a trend. I'm not going to refer to any specific area, but I can say across all areas, we've seen a trend that indicates. Uh, uh, a sharp increase in both um, poaching of endangered species for um, exports, for um, illegal trade, and for bushmeat. Um, I think um, one of the reasons for the bushmeat is, you know, many people just live hand to mouth. If they can't work today, they don't eat today or tomorrow. Um, and uh, I think the economic impact of this coronavirus is, is, is going to be devastating across uh, parts of Africa, especially the poorer parts of Africa. And that is going to translate into increased pressure on wildlife and the natural environment. Okay. The next up is um, Amy Young. Amy? Let's see. Hi, there, did that work? There, go ahead, Amy, we can hear you. Great, thank you. Sorry, I've got planes flying overhead. I'm not sure if you can hear with the windows closed. Um, wow, uh, that was so much information, thank you. Uh, I already can't wait to watch it again. <laughs> you provided us with so much information. Um, and to go back and talk with Mike more about projects, uh, now that I know more about what you do. Um, I guess my comment question also relates to Dr. Carolyn Robinson. Um, I thought it was really interesting to see the stark distinction between the two locations and, and the difference in their success with the community. Um, I mentioned on the previous presentation that Arthur gave the other day, uh, I'm a trained social scientist, so I, I focused on the human dimension of conservation community-based conservation. Um, and it can be very frustrating that conservationists are still learning how important that is. Um, and even on conservation issues that are not as complex as what you just talked about, they're still reluctant to focus on community and working with people. So I love that you're dealing with such a uh, an atrocious situation and still it comes back to community that that is still being proven as effective and necessary so um, I, I guess have you already published that information dr. Robinson or is that something you're working on publishing because I would certainly like to see more of that in peer-reviewed journal articles that we can point to <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah I mean it's a great point and, and you're correct you know it's um uh, as a, well, I was trained as a primatologist, so I came into caring about communities through the back door <laughs> um, and was immediately shunned by many of my own colleagues as well. Um, so in my own sort of individual work as a researcher before I joined Chinguetta, um, I've pointed a lot to how working particularly with hunters uh, in Zonga Songa, um, provides different types of information for conservationists, right? And the big, the big drawback to using social science methods in conservation is a, a gross misperception that the only way to do social science or to work with communities involves 
years and years and years right. and years of presence on the ground. Um, right. And so there's an immediate sort of pushback of, oh, I don't have the time for you to come in and hang out with people and figure out what's going on. Um, but that's not the case, right? Um, anthropology has been present working in public health sectors and other places doing um, what I do with Chengeta, which is called rapid ethnographic assessment. Um, so there's a lot of models in other literatures for that, and we're just working on publishing those in conservation okay. uh, realms. Um, but you're correct, right? It's, it's sort of seen as what you put in to get the funding, but it's putting in the work to do it uh, is not always welcome because people don't necessarily understand how the work takes place or that, um, and a lot of this comes, you know, from a theoretical perspective of what conservation programs consider to be data or valid data. And generally communications with indigenous communities are not valued as data by Western science perspective. Um, still, yeah, yeah, still. And so it's finding ways in what we do at Chinguetta to quantify that and to connect it to, um, to find different ways to sort of make them see that it's the same language as they're speaking um, and that it can be done quickly, right? So I've trialed it with students in, um, in Cameroon uh, in a three month project. You know, we got further than another group had in 20 years um, by using yeah. rapid assessments. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, it's part of the approach that we use in the, the Chingata communities part. I mean, Zanga Sanga is a bit different because I've been there for 12 years. So I, <laughs> I have put in the time depth, um, but at the moment we're demonstrating how you can do this in other places. And that, um, and it's not, you don't need me to do it or someone who has a PhD in social science. Um, it's about locating the right individual that has the right ability um, to make those community connections. And generally there are people in the community who are often considered from an outside perspective, the least educated, because you want someone who's going to stay put in a community. So many times um, in Cameron, I work primarily with, you know, young single mothers that are not likely to migrate to marry a man in another community because of their current situation, right? But they're the exact right person to be having these conversations. Um, so I am happy to email you some links to not just my own work, but other um, some other small papers that are out there that sort of bolster funding efforts. For sure. That would be great. Yes, yeah. maybe Chris can be able to share contact. But just thank you so much, and Rory, for making that such a huge part of the presentation because it really truly is. And uh, wow, I mean, even in the worst situation, you know, not in the little smaller, easier conservation issues than the really big ones. So thank you. Welcome. Thank you very much, Amy, and thanks, Carolyn. Yeah, sure. Uh, just want to check, Rory, did you want to add anything? No, um, I think uh, just one, maybe one little thing. And I think a, a reason a lot of um, organizations or parks or services are struggling with the com community uh, approach is, is a question of trust. Um, they, they have to get their heads around the idea that they're going to hand over control to a group of people who do not have the same perhaps level of education or organization or uh, structure or authority that they have. Um, and it's, it's just a step you have to take. And it requires a real understanding of those communities. And when you engage with them and, and, and really spend time with them, you realize they live closer to nature than any of us. So convincing them of the importance of nature is far easier than convincing some individual who lives in Manhattan. That's all I wanted to add. Thanks, Rory. Uh, Katrina Ecker? Um, yes, good evening. Um, uh, a question may be a little bit beside the point, but what other large mammals are in Goma? What do you come across there? Camels, cows, <laughs> um, really um, there's very few large mammals. Um, there are in Dogon country, a few lion, um, very important lion because they are you know, West African 
um, subspecies, so close closer to Asiatic lions than than other lions. Um, the same gene pool as I uh, found in Guinea, um, but there's very little other than the elephants. Um, it really is a, a open desert. Um, there's very little there. I mean, we've we found we've when I say you know you, not large mammals, but we found ripples vultures, for example, which were believed to be extinct in the area. We found them on that mountain, that picture I showed at Montumburi. Um, the um, cheetah have been spotted by uh, unmanned aerial UAV systems, um, so drones. I won't say whose, um, and that's the 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 famous legendary Algerian uh, Saharan cheetah that everyone believed could be a myth, but there's there's actual again it's, doubt is going to be made public, but there is footage. So so there is. There, there are animals out there. Um, gazelles? But, yeah, there are gazelles. And um, they, you know, the, 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 it's interesting what's happened recently because, so, you know, the question of, of climate change, um, the, the situation in the, in, in the Sahel, is, well, in, in the, particularly in the Guama, which is, really is a crossroads, it's a, such an ecotone, is that, um, less rainfall but it's actually a big your pardon it's more rainfall coming down quicker and then running off because there's no more ground cover so you've got this this escalation of of the problem through overgrazing all the cattle concentrated around the, the water points um, and then this shorter rainfall period very very short suddenly heavy so nothing penetrates um, means all the people are concentrating around what water there is all their livestock the people the camels the goats and everything else and it's 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 frightening you go we've i've 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 taken drone footage of literally tens and tens of thousands of cattle starving and <clears throat> our partners wild foundation did a study of all these cattle who they belong to uh, in the gorma and found 80% belong to the political elite in Bamako, in the capital. And they serve no purpose other than status. And it's more and more, and they've pushed back the wildlife, pushed back the wildlife, pushed back the wildlife, destroyed the, the, uh, the habitat, um, exasper exasperated this problem of, of runoff, of water, through capping of the soil. It's, it's absolute devastation. You do not see a living thing. So um, that's, that's a Goma in the north. In the southern part of the Goma and Dogon country, there is a lot more wildlife. Um, you know, you'll, yeah. But again, you know, I'll be quite honest with you. Um, I wish I had more time to see, to look for wildlife. I, I, you know, and my colleagues, but most of the time we're running around looking for people. Um, yeah. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you, Rory. Um, uh, Cheryl, just uh, just one uh, quick, uh, two quick announcements, and then we're going to allow all of you to be able to unmute yourself in the discussion. Uh, before I um, do that, I just want to make two comments, please. And the first is, Rod, um, thanks for introducing Rory to us. I uh, I'm actually really stunned by that, and uh, very appreciative of your approach. So thanks for that. And um, then I just want to also remind that coming Tuesday is uh, Dr. Greta, um, what is her surname, Iori. Um, and that's going to be fascinating to um, the, uh, the illegal trade and the role of women in that. And when you were refer referring to, to slaves, I think there's a link there, Rory. I think there's a link. We'll hear on Tuesday what the situation is there. So thanks to you, Rod, and thanks to everybody else. You are now we are a family, and uh, we can chat away. And if you want to unmute yourself, just do so and uh, chat away and ask Rory the questions that you would like to ask. You can still raise the hand, and we can announce you. But uh, thanks so much. Yes, Cheryl, your turn. I would please. just like to make one comment before before we open the floor. Just. It, once again, it goes through to this whole thing. If you look at any of the, most of the talks, it comes down to communities. 
and and all the successful projects have come down to communities. The Nayasa project, the project of Radzila, you know, nothing about us can be for nothing about us without us can be for us. That was uh, one slogan that they came up with in Congo. So it's all about communities. Thanks, Rory. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Rory. I agree with you. Cheryl. Hi, Rory. I've been in um, community engagement and development for many years, including environmental education. Um, but I, from my studies, I found that in a rural community which surrounds a protected area, the adult community members are sending in the youngsters to poach because there's many reasons for that. Number one, they can't serve a jail sentence. They can't certain things that just mm -hmm. they, can't, they can't do. Um, but how would you, when you come across, what is your age group that you are finding that are poaching? That, that, that is the first question. And the second question is, if you come across the youth, like I'm talking about primary school children, like the age of 12, 13, um, poaching, how, how would you deal with that? Um, okay. First, it depends on the on the country. I mean, we're in we're in a number of different areas, and they they vary greatly. So I'll I'll explain about Mali and Burkina Faso, um, and then I'll defer to Carolyn for Zanga Sanga because she's much more knowledgeable about the the communities and the the, the children and the poaching in in Zanga Sanga. In Mali, Burkina Faso, there is there are a lot of young frustrated, unemployed, um, bored young men um, with no hope, no future, no, nothing to look forward to. And the problem there is someone comes along with a bucket of cash and a gun and a motorcycle and says, you work for me and gives them a, an ideology or a, a slogan. It doesn't make, doesn't take much. And, and sends them off, whether it's to poach or to um, you know, become a terrorist or to uh, deal in diamonds, whatever, um, be a bandit. Um, that's, a, that's a huge problem in the Sahel, is young men unemployed with, with no future and, and absolutely no prospects. Um, De-radicalization um, can only be achieved through dealing with that problem. Of the youth, so um, that's the poaching up up in that area, and it's the younger people do it simply because they are that environment is extreme. Uh, an older person is not going to be able to um, race around uh, in 50 plus Celsius. I mean, when I say heat, I thought I knew heat from the Zambezi Valley and Mozambique and uh, you know, Congo Basin. That is, the, it is incomparable. It is absolute hell and dust, dust storms and everything else. It is a really harsh environment. So um, the younger people also, it's a, especially amongst the Tuareg, it's a warrior culture. A young man has to prove himself um, to be fit. So, so he's encouraged to go out. Tuareg believes the, the women own all the property. It's, a, not, it's not a matriarchal society, um, but they have a lot of power. They own all the assets. And the men are, are meant to wander. They're meant to go and find fortune. Um, so that's that's Mali. But uh, Zanga Sanga and kids, I, I would defer to Carolyn, if you don't mind, Carolyn. Hi, great question. So, um, I mean, it's been a number of years since in Zanga Sanga they did um, work with hunters. So actually, it's been about 10 years since I worked with about 200 hunters, over 200 hunters in the entire protected areas across 10 villages. And that was considered to be possibly about 10% of the active hunting population uh, in the region. And none of them were at that time, right, 10 years ago of primary school age. Generally, I mean, they ranged anywhere from 18 to mid 40s. Um, that's not to say that younger children aren't in, involved as porters or as part of a group of individuals that is hunting. But you know, it's not quite as common in other places. I will say that um, in the last, during our last field mission in March, um, and in the last 10 years, a big concern, particularly of the women, and I guess the men, the older men as well, 
is um, that there, the lack of alternative things to do essentially is where we said uh, when school's out or school's not in session because of COVID or a uh, political crisis um, that, you know, younger and younger men are turning towards hunting. And of course, younger and younger women are being coming involved in market trades, et cetera. Um, so, you know, a big push in our last community discussions was, um, you know, there's not been develop you know, huge development projects in Zonda Sanga since JKZ left in 2009. Um, there's some limited projects going on. Of course, Rod's Lodge provides jobs for individuals, but rather than um, bringing able to provide jobs, we've been working with younger age groups of men to create associations or something that gives them a different direction or something to fill their time. Um, it's, so it's not quite as common. That's not to say it's not a looming possibility. Um, as you know, I think it'll be interesting in the next year, we're hopefully doing another follow-up survey to the one I did 10 years ago to get a better picture of who hunters actually are right now. Yeah, because mine's quite recent and um, it's quite scary because the community is living well below the bread line and um, they're living off social grants. And you know the social grants it's it's not really it, a community can't really survive on that and they're also living off the land now with the drought and everything happening yeah they've gone into the protected areas now because that's where the closest meat sources or protein sources so um yeah we've got youngsters yeah. coming in and they've got various hunting methods from dogs to catties to yeah. snitching mm -hmm. snares and yeah well i'm just trying now to as what Rory said, something very true to, in the beginning of his talk, um, you don't tell people what to do. You work with the people. Am I right, Rory? Absolutely, yeah. Yes. It's, 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 it's got to be their initiative. You only assist their initiative, Yeah, that's right, yes. So you've yeah. got to make it like their ownership. They want to make a difference. They've got to try and, and build things. But it's not easy. Our careers are not easy because we're dealing with this. And it's not going out and do vegetation surveys. But... Carolyn, Rory, I would love to contact you and have long chats about this because maybe you'll be able to enlighten me of where to take this further. Yeah, sure. Thank I you. thought that'd be great. Thank you. Okay, yeah. thank you. Can, can I just add one thing? I, I'm going to put it in, 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 in plain idiot speak because I'm not a sociologist or an anthropologist's backside. But um, dealing with communities, from my own experience in the bush, the what do you, and, and just correct me, jump in and, and tell me to shut up, Carolyn, or Don't anyone. Worry. Um, shut up, Rory. I said, Rory, shut up. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, you know, the law of Yanta, um, you know, an individual in an African community and many, or like a Scandinavian community in the, the law of Yanta, you do not put yourself above the group or outside the group because mm -hmm. the worst punishment you can possibly have is to be separated from the community to be outcast and which is why working with a community as a community where there, a consensus is reached an agreement is reached but truly reached where the elders the, yeah. the leaders the influencers all agree this is the way we're going to go and this is what is uh, what we're going to do um, is incredibly powerful because if someone tries to buck that as an individual um, or he, he goes against what has been decided, um, he's, it's, it's even more uh, difficult than breaking a law that's been put in place from some guy far away at the top of government in the capital city. Is that correct, Carolyn? I mean, I'm not sure I would feel comfortable generalizing that far ever, but I mean, yeah, it is. I think a really important part of conservation work with communities is that um, it doesn't, it can't come from the organization, right? So even though myself and Liz Hall, who um, helps run our Zonga Sanga program, have worked in the area for 10 years and collectively as a research group for 40 years, um, we never presumed to be able to do projects. So when we started, I started working with Changetta, I went back and, you know, it has to be the community's choice whether they're going to participate with Changetta or not, right? They've seen the dogs around, they've seen the, the rangers, you know, getting trained. Um, 
I wouldn't show up and say, oh, great, now we're here to do some community work. Um, it had to be the elders' decision to, to do the project with us, right? So all, all the chiefs of the area met with Rory and Changetta to, to discuss what we do. And then, you know, it's sort of also being constantly cognizant of making people aware that they can leave the relationship at any time, right? And that um, it's a partnership. And that if any point they don't like what I'm doing or what our teams on the ground are doing, right? By international law and just human rights, they can leave the partnership. Um, it's not something that we're committed to forever. And that sort of ability to walk away, as Rory is saying, is m more likely to keep us working together long-term. Thank you. Um, one thing I concur, uh, Rory, is that once, and uh, also uh, Caroline, once the community have made the decision, once the community have decided what needs to be done, that sticks for a very, very, very long time. If, if you've done it right and they've made the decision what they and how they want to do it, then you can know um, that lasts for very long because that consensus is sort of the, the community trust. Um, but those processes to get there is rather complicated sometimes. But anyway, um, I think it all base, it's, it's that trust you showed to them. Very important. Never, never, never raise expectations. Never. The minute you do that, it's manipulation. Mm -hmm. sort of that. But that's another discussion. Good point. All right. Um, anybody else? Are we, I would like to know if there's any of the students who would like to uh, make any comment. We have a few students from the uh, University of Technology. Uh, any one of you would raise your hand, make a comment, or ask a question. Sure, this was very informative for you guys still being on at this stage. None? Right. Nobody wants to ask. They're all right. scared of Dr. Ogilvy watching them. No, she can just switch off her camera then. She's not watching <laughs> them anymore. <laughs> we'll not do it right now. <laughs> uh, but there, is yep. a, uh, there are quite a few dynamic kids on board still. And I've got an advanced diploma student on board. Her name's Veronica. So she's uh, passed her diploma already. And yeah, she's growing leaps and bounds. I don't know whether Veronica can hear us or whether she can't. Um, no pressure, Veronica. <laughs> <laughs> Veronica, we are not going to unmute you. You can decide to mute or unmute whenever you want to. But I, uh, now that I heard about you, I will definitely, Marit, write down that name. We will stay in touch with Veronica. Okay. No pressure, Ver Veronica. They Over say dynamite you. comes in small packages, eh? I'm going to switch your television. I'm going to switch off your sound and your camera now. Yeah. <laughs> uh, my friend Janssen, you are you are terribly quiet tonight. <laughs> uh, Rory, no, uh, thanks, uh, Chris, but I don't want to get a bad reputation like some of my colleagues. You know, I'm always <laughs> asking questions. No, no, um, no, no. But no, I would no, be no. interested, Rory. Yes, I would be very interested. Uh, you've got a very interesting perspective. Hats off to you. Uh, your background, your professional background, and how did you grow as an individual internally to develop these new perspectives that are quite embracing rather than confrontational? It's very interesting because I sense a military man in you, and yet uh, you've crossed the Rubicon, so to speak. Um. Good question, Janssen. I, I, I was in the military for a short while in a, in a uh, uh, quite a renowned unit and decided it was definitely not for me. I hate being told what to do. Um, I have variously been struck by lightning, uh, had all sorts of ridiculous things happen that I think have humiliated me a bit. But honestly, 
Um, seven years ago, eight years ago, when I started Changeta, um, I had reached a point, uh, what do you call it? There's all sorts of cliche terms for it, but um, I had gone back into the bush. I was missing it. And I was shocked by what I found. Um, I found rangers couldn't track. Um, police officers didn't engage with communities. Um, all these basic, simple, um, tried and tested um, techniques for succeeding in preventing or stopping poaching or other act illegal activity just weren't, weren't being used anymore. Um, I'm a professional guide. <clears throat> um, I did a lot of other, I also worked as a ranger and, and what have you. Um, but uh, to be quite honest with you, I wanted to spend my life walking around the bush, observing wildlife, and that's what I love. Um, but I reached a point of extreme frustration where I saw, I don't believe I'm the right person for all of this at all. I believe my role is bringing together the right people um, and helping them. Um, I started training rangers by teaching them tracking, tactical tracking. I taught all sorts. Uh, in the past, police, special forces in, in the first world and elsewhere on how to find people in conflict environments <clears throat> as a speciality. Um, so I started doing that uh, voluntarily and I kept on discovering more and more holes. Um, for example, doctrine. They, I found entire departments had no system. There was no, there is no doctrine. They've got nothing. Um, all they have is a hodgepodge of bits of training provided by former soldiers, police officers, or other individuals that come through, um, and maybe a basic military training at some point. And then they sort of figured it out as they've gone along. A lot of them have a lot of, um, a, a lot of experience and, and uh, commitment, passion. Uh, but what's really needed is adapted systems for approaching the problem in a particular given environment. And the only way I see that, I, I believe all of us are amateurs in all of this. That's the correct approach. Um, whether it's uh, Dr. Carolyn Joss Robinson talking about uh, uh, tactical pursuit, or whether it's a special, ex special forces soldier talking about community, um, it it requires bringing together people from diverse backgrounds, experience, knowledge together to attack the problem, um, and leave their egos behind. Because I believe I really believe the biggest problem in all of this, and in, in terms of dealing with the problem amongst parks and wildlife and others, is no one wants to listen to anyone else. Um, everyone seems to think they've got the, the, the magic bullet and the solution, and they don't. Um, so I, I, I sit down and, and I'm very forthright. Um, I mean, I've, I've, I've worked, I've held the rank of colonel in one West African country. I've, uh, um, I've, uh, I've been a parks and wildlife officer in three countries. I've uh, been a former uh, paramilitary police officer when I was 19 years old um, in a, uh, as a, as a, as a uh, what do you call it, reserve officer. Um, but at heart, I'm just a tracker guide. That's what I want to be. And, uh, but I can contribute tracking. Um, someone else can contribute community. Someone else can contribute uh, a command and control. Um, and we've all got to learn from each other and put it together into a system that is truly designed to achieve results that stop the poaching and are politically palatable and benefit the community. That's it. Sorry. Not rocket science. It's just my own personal philosophy. And Rory, how did you get involved in Mali? I mean, that's, uh, you know, I mean, out of all the places on planet Earth, eh? Yeah. There's um, got to be a story there. I was contacted by Dr. Susan Canney um, um, from Mali Elephant Project, the director of the Mali Elephant Project in Oxford, and her colleagues. And they, they were talking to everyone. Um, 
absolutely every organization on the planet, um, from Israelis to um, Brits to Americans to South Africans to everyone. And we sat down and um, we were immediately on the same page in terms of philosophy, uh, attitude, approach, and uh, the concept of designing a system to attack the, uh, 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 a doctrine to, to attack the problem in Mali specifically for protecting those elephants in that environment and finding the right people to contribute to doing that. Um, so, but it also required someone stupid enough to go out there and find out what the hell was going on. So, so I went out by myself initially um, in 2015, 2016, and, and that was a bit stupid. So yeah, it's getting involved required, was, was started with being a bit thick, I suppose. <laughs> or dedicated. Oh, yeah. I don't know. I think my I wife has a very firm, my wife, my lovely wife, Mariette, has a very firm opinion on which that would be. <laughs> yeah, I know, I, I can imagine, I can imagine. You know, it's such a pity, because I mean, I must say, I'd, it's on my bucket list. I'd love to go and see them going through that, uh, that like, oh, is it? yeah. The pop is absolutely yeah. incredible. It's yeah. honestly, it's, you know, uh, people say, oh, it looks a bit like Monument Valley. It does look like a bit like Monument Valley in the United States, except the mountains are three times higher. It's, oh, wow. When you see those, those images of those, those rock monoliths, you don't realize how gigantic they are. We went up one, Homburi, to go and look for these Ripples vultures once and see if they were nesting. And uh, we so ba badly underestimated the height. I mean, you see it on a map and you've got a, you know, you've, you've got, the, you just, it looks, you don't realize how gigantic they are. It took us, we thought a three hour climb, it took us 12 hours to get up, overnight to come down. Um, it was, yeah, it's, it's truly spectacular. It's an, and the people are, are fascinating. Um, from the Tuareg uh, to people living in holes in the ground. And those t on top of those mountains, believe it or not, there's people living up there growing garlic. <laughs> they just live on garlic and they don't come down. They've got water. <laughs> I can't afford coming down and eating all that garlic. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Part of their defense measures. Yeah. yeah. No, it's, a, it's an absolutely stunning, beautiful country, fascinating people, incredible culture from the music to the history. Even the Romans were there, for goodness sakes. The Romans went down into Mali, to, to, as far as yeah. roughly where Timbuktu is now. Um, I mean, the, there's, there's a group, an ethnic group called the Arma. This blew me away. Descended from the Irish. <laughs> Irish, <laughs> Irish, <laughs> Irish, <laughs> Irish, Irish, Cornish, and Andalusian renegades who were hired by the Moroccans to go and invade and take Timbuktu in, this, in the, I think it was the 16th century, in the 1500s. They took it and then got abandoned there. So they just sort of set up their own clan amongst the Songhai. Set up uh, their own brewery, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there we go, eh? <laughs> What's the Irish do? <laughs> yeah, anyway, fascinating place, yeah. Yeah. If you can get there, yeah. Unfortunately. Yeah, I'd love to. I'd love to. Yeah. And, and tell on, me, guys. one, one, can I, Chris, can I ask one more question? <laughs> Uh, well, uh, that that will make feel, uh, that will make Gump and Davies feel better. So please do. <laughs> um, so you know, having having read what I would, I mean, I read as much as I can. But from what I understand is that the actual migration of the elephants has changed in the last ten years, um, particularly. Um, and and I think the concern is in the northeast where the water point is that they're starting to avoid that. And there's some concern about that. You know, this is a major issue. It, it is a major issue, and, and our partners, um, well, Foundation Mali Elephant Project, have been engaged with the government on that. Um, so, I mean, there's, there's been a number of things. On one occasion, um, a group of elephants, I think it was maybe eight years ago, seven years ago, maybe less, just, just took off into the desert in a straight line until they couldn't go anymore and died. Um, oh, wow. And that is, there's no historical water there. That is just literally the frustration of they're being kept away or there's, they're competing with people, goats, cattle for water. Uh, one of the problems was that people were encouraged at one point 
by the government to go to certain that same water point you're talking about and and they just converged on it and there was just no space for the elephants there's nowhere for them to get in um yeah so uh, unfortunately you know in in such an environment now with you you know i mean it's 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 hard to explain how bad it is you can't um, you can move along certain arteries with convoys, with the UN or the French military or the Malian military. And yeah, you could get hit. But getting off and going into areas where, where our unit has been operating, we would go into villages that hadn't seen anyone since 2013. They've had no medical assistance. They can't get out. So the, the unit was treating 200 people a day, giving medical treatment um, to assist them. And uh, just literally... Um, using dead ground, you know, negative terrain to find ways of moving unobserved. Um, but when we first went out there, they said, no, you can't go into these areas. You need at least a battalion. Um, so yeah, it's extreme. It's such an extreme environment. So when it's like that to get out there, first of all, assess what's going on, but to try and any sort of programs to large scale programs to solve these problems are nigh impossible. It's, it's so difficult. Yeah. Oh, well, good job. Well done. Thanks.